So we've been talking about the three activities that Deleuze and Guattari want to distinguish from philosophy. The first we saw was contemplation. The second was reflection. And in this video, we'll talk about the third activity, communication. Communication, Deleuze and Guattari say, is not philosophy. And they write, Nor does philosophy find any final refuge in communication, which only works under the sway of opinions in order to create consensus and not concepts. The idea of a Western democratic conversation between friends has never produced a single concept. The idea comes perhaps from the Greeks, but they distrust it so much and subjected it to such harsh treatment that the concept was more like the ironical soliloquy bird that surveyed the battlefield of destroyed rival opinions, the drunken guests at the banquet. So there's quite a lot going on in that block of text, and I'm going to break that up into three little pieces, starting with, nor does philosophy find any final refuge in communication, which only works under the sway of opinions in order to create consensus and not concepts. That way we're starting off with a contrast between Deleuze and Guattari's definition of philosophy and this thing they call communication. And we can differentiate these two based on their aims. The aim of philosophy uh, is to create concepts. It's the art of forming concepts, according to Deleuze and Guattari. And communication, they say, has the aim of generating consensus. Um, those are two different things, and it's interesting to think about why that might be, which we'll get into. What is consensus? Well, consensus is basically an agreement. It's agreements between people or amongst a group of people about something. And it's surprising to see Deleuze and Guattari cast consensus agreement uh, in such an unfavorable light, uh, because I think the idea that consensus is a good thing is an idea that probably a lot of people hold. A lot of people probably think, yeah, it's, it's good when people agree with each other, isn't it? It's interesting to think about why Deleuze and Guattari might not necessarily think so, or why they might not think philosophy should have that as its ultimate goal. Taking a closer look at this notion of consensus and this notion of a Western democratic conversation between friends, what philosophical trend or assumption are Deleuze and Guattari taking aim at here? I think it's pretty clear that they're taking aim at an idea that on the surface may seem somewhat uncontroversial. Basically, it's the idea that through rational discussion, people can arrive at an agreement or an understanding amongst each other about what is true or false, what is right or wrong, what's acceptable or unacceptable. And this is an idea that I think probably a lot of people would agree with. And a perhaps more robust version of this idea has been articulated and defended by a philosopher named Jürgen Habermas. with something he called communicative rationality and something he called an ideal speech situation. Two very influential ideas in philosophy that I think roughly correlate to two notions that Deleuze and Guattari put forward in this little piece of text. We'll take a closer look at that now. Jürgen Habermas is a German philosopher who thinks that communication has an inherent capacity to help people arrive at rational conclusions through the very act of talking them out. And he thinks this because Habermas looks at the way a conversation works, and he thinks that at the very least, to have a conversation, a meaningful conversation, people need to have some kind of understanding of certain rules, language rules, rules about grammar, and syntax, as well as rules about what words actually mean. It's very hard to have a meaningful conversation if you're talking to someone who speaks a totally different language than you or is using a word in such a way that doesn't really correlate to your understanding of that word's meaning. I'll give you an example. We need to look no further than these videos themselves, this, this task of trying to unpack Deleuze and Guattari's text of what is philosophy. Let's go back to our first video where we talked about contemplation. So Deleuze and Guattari start out with the claim that philosophy is not contemplation. 
Well, before we can even begin to evaluate such a claim, try and evaluate whether it's true or not, we first have to get clear on what they actually mean by philosophy and contemplation. Because it's very apparent from reading it that their sense of philosophy and of contemplation is almost certainly going to be different than the sense you or I are uh, working with before we actually go into the text and start reading it. So we need to get clear on what those words mean before we can evaluate the, the truth of that claim. And we were able to do that, hopefully, by looking at Plato, trying to understand how Plato said we need to contemplate forms. And okay, we have our understanding of contemplation. Contemplation is a mode of thinking where we're thinking about forms. But then Deleuze and Guattari point out that forms are concepts. And if we understand their definition of philosophy as the art of forming concepts, well, then we can evaluate that claim and say, well, that seems true. Provided we accept these definitions, we accept the definition of philosophy as the art of forming concepts, and we accept contemplation as a mode of thinking in which we are thinking about concepts, well, then it seems to logically follow that philosophy has to come before contemplation, and therefore, necessarily, they're two totally different moments. They're two totally different activities. So we're able to evaluate that claim. And while the definitions of those terms are certainly up for debate, we can at least make a, make a stab at evaluating that claim as being true because now we understand what the two words mean. We know what philosophy and contemplation mean. So we can evaluate the claim that philosophy is not contemplation. So that's an example right there of how we have to start out getting what uh, Habermas calls comprehensibility. We have to be able to comprehend one another. So we're trying to comprehend, as the readers, we're trying to comprehend Deleuze and Guattari, which is definitely no easy task. Um, but in trying to do so, we can then move on to looking for truth. Now, of course, Habermas is hardly the only philosopher to make this observation uh, about language. In fact, many people who are not philosophers could probably make this observation, uh, or at least intuit, on some level that a meaningful conversation between people necessarily involves some mutual understanding of the, the terms being used and the, the grammar being used and, and so on. Uh, what makes Habermas's thought interesting, as well as controversial, is that he takes it a step further. Looking at the way that a conversation works, Habermas thinks that it, it, if you have people talking amongst each other, and they're both understanding what the other person is saying. They're both obeying the language rules. Habermas says that this presupposes that these people in a conversation already possess an understanding of those language rules, of grammar, syntax, and semantics. And Habermas thinks, well, if people are able to understand these language rules, then they should be able to understand other rules, like logical rules, or rules having to do with truth. In other words, if people, Habermas thinks, if people are able to understand, for instance, the meaning of a given term being used in a conversation, and they're able to understand the, the, the meaning of sentences that are built around this term, they should also possess the capacity to determine whether those sentences, those statements, are true or false. So if people are having a conversation and they're using the, the term red, like the color red, and someone says, the sky is red, and if people in that conversation understand what the sky is, what that term represents, and they understand what red is, what the term red represents, someone else can jump in and say, well, no, that's false. That's not true. The sky isn't red. And so armed with this particular way of looking at language, understanding how language works, how meaningful com communication between people works, Habermas argues that communication itself possesses a certain capacity, what he calls communicative rationality, the capacity for communication itself to provide us with a way of arriving rationally at a consensus on some issue. It's not that Deleuze and Guattari doubt that communication can bring about consensus. They seem to think it can. It's just not something that really interests them. And this has everything to do, really, 
with the way in which Deleuze and Guattari conceive of philosophy as a creative activity, and in fact, how they conceive of creativity in general. For Deleuze and Guattari both, the creative act, whether it's a philosopher creating a concept, an artist creating a work of art, it's something that they almost always couch in terms of almost violence, violation and disruption. You know, creation for Deleuze and Guattari is something that is supposed to disrupt. It's something that upsets the apple cart. Consider this quote from Deleuze, which he said during a 1990 interview, so just a year before What is Philosophy was published, where he says that we have to hijack speech. Creating has always been something different from communicating. And really pay attention to the language he's using, the word choice. We have to hijack speech. That's pretty extreme, but it gives us a glimpse into what Deleuze and also Guattari would have in mind when they think about creativity. When you hijack something, you're diverting it off of its original intended course. Maybe it's a course that something has been on for quite a long time. Deleuze and Guattari are very interested in experimenting in not only their writing of philosophy, but also their reading of philosophy. When Deleuze reads a philosopher, that reading is itself an act of creativity. Maybe one of the things that makes him somewhat controversial as a philosopher, because there's always that question of where you draw that line between creative readings and just sort of making things up as we go along. But that's a separate issue. We'll revisit that at some point down the road. For now, we can consider how this approach to philosophy and to creativity in general as a necessarily disruptive act, something that challenges the status quo, something that goes against the grain, something that doesn't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over again. We can contrast that with what Habermas is looking for in his search for mutual understanding between people. Communication for Habermas is aiming towards consensus. Deleuze and Guattari acknowledge that, and they criticize that, because consensus, Deleuze and Guattari point out, necessarily involves not creating, but capitulating. Um, it, it requires that people be on the same page. We, we saw the way that Habermas looks at communication it requires that people accept and follow certain rules, including rules about what words mean. It's very hard to have a meaningful conversation with somebody if I'm using a word with my own meaning and you have a totally different meaning of that word. We're going to get confused. Well, Deleuze and Guattari aren't afraid of that. They're not afraid of that kind of confusion because for them, that's that's exactly where creativity thrives. It thrives in someone coming out with a new way of interpreting something. So they're not as interested in everyone getting together and following the rules. Deleuze and Guattari are more interested in, in breaking the rules or at least uh, calling them into question. Okay. So now let's look at our idea of a Western democratic conversation between friends, something that Deleuze and Guattari say has never produced a single concept. So what is an idea of a Western democratic conversation between friends? What did Deleuze and Guattari have in mind uh, with this notion? And why hasn't it produced a single concept? Why do they think it hasn't? What I think Deleuze and Guattari roughly have in mind corresponds to the second of Habermas's ideas that I want to introduce here in contradistinction to what Deleuze and Guattari are after. And that is this notion of what Habermas calls an ideal speech situation. An ideal speech situation is a scenario in which certain specific criteria are met, criteria that upon being met are supposed to optimize the participants of that conversation for having a, a rational discussion, uh, having a fair and free discussion, 
Uh, some of those criteria, I'll only mention a couple, but some of them are that no one is coerced into saying something that they don't actually think. That's a big one. Uh, another one is that anyone who is qualified to speak about whatever the topic is, is allowed to, that they're given their time and their space to speak as long as they have the right qualifications. Certain objections to this notion of an ideal speech situation have been raised. For example, the idea that someone could be qualified or unqualified to speak in a given discourse seems to beg the question of well, who exactly gets to decide that? Who makes that call in terms of who can speak and who can't? And it's been argued by some that ultimately whoever makes that decision is usually going to be the person or a group of people that holds the most power in a given society. And thus, it's ultimately the powerful who decide who can speak and who can't in a given discourse. And Habermas's thought, his idea of an ideal speech situation has been criticized for failing to take this into account. Now, another criticism that's been lodged at uh, Habermas's ideal speech situation is more of a practical one, which quite simply is that it's not realistic, that Habermas expects far too much of people for this kind of a scenario to ever actually take place. Of course, Haber Habermas himself has said that his ideal speech situation that he has in mind really is just that, an ideal. It's something that we strive for, even if we never realize it. Habermas wants us to set the bar very high. But even if we never actually manifest the perfect, free, rational discourse, we do our best and we try to get as close to such an ideal as possible. So we have, on the one hand, some ethical criticisms and some practical criticisms of this ideal speech situation. But neither of these kinds of critiques really captures the substance of the one Deleuze and Guattari put forward, where they want to distinguish communication from philosophy. And it has everything to do with their understanding of a concept, of what it takes to create a concept, and what a concept is actually supposed to be doing. We've seen that first people have to be in agreement on certain language rules, grammar and syntax, and they need to be in agreement about the meaning of the words that everyone in the discourse is using. Everyone needs to be on the same page. And in this conversation, ultimately what we're supposed to be working towards is more agreement. We're working towards consensus. So we're starting out needing some kind of mutual understanding and then we're working towards more mutual understanding. We're starting out with agreement, working towards more agreement. It's consensus from end to end. And Deleuze and Guattari are looking at this and saying, when do we create something new? Because for them, as, as we've seen, creativity is practically synonymous with disruption, with going against the grain. You might be thinking, well, why can't people be in agreement and also create something new? Why can't a discussion among friends who are on the same page, who are following the Western rational paradigm of discourse, why can't that create a new concept at, from Deleuze and Guattari's perspective? It's a little tricky to understand, partly because we haven't gotten into their chapter called What is a Concept, where they really flesh out in, in excruciating detail exactly what they have in mind when they use this term. They have a very specific idiosyncratic uh, sense of the word concept. But what we can say at this point is that a concept, for Deleuze in particular, has to meet a need. If a new concept arises, a new concept is created to replace an old concept, it's because that old concept is no longer doing its job. That old concept has either left something out or doesn't really, doesn't really account for something as exquisitely as it could or as completely as it could, and now this new concept is here to fill in some of those gaps.
or that old concept totally missed the mark and we need a new concept to fix all these problems that we had no idea about until until the moment some other inventive creative philosopher came along uh, to fill in those holes, fill in those gaps. As Deleuze and Guattari understand it, this necessarily will involve challenging the status quo, challenging those very accepted meanings of terms that for Habermas are necessary for having a meaningful conversation. What Deleuze and Guattari are putting forward is that in no uncertain terms, philosophy is messy. It's contentious at times. It's just the nature of the discipline that people won't always be in agreement. The last line of this section that I want to talk about here is probably the most obscure one that we'll have looked at at this point. And this is the sentence where the authors write, The idea comes perhaps from the Greeks, but they distrusted it so much and subjected it to such harsh treatment that the concept was more like the ironical soliloquy bird that surveyed the battlefield of destroyed rival opinions, and then parentheses, the drunken guests at the banquet. So the idea that perhaps comes from the Greeks, this is the basic assumption that we sketched out at the very beginning of the video, namely the assumption that through communication, people can arrive at consensus on some issue or another. And by the Greeks, Deleuze and Guattari mean, of course, the ancient Greek philosophers. So what they're saying is people who link philosophy and communication together are getting this idea or think they're getting this idea from studying ancient Greek philosophy. An example of what this might look like. Well, maybe someone takes a look at, say, the Socratic Dialogues. It was kind of in, in the title, isn't it? Their dialogues, their conversations. Say someone is looking at the Mino, for example. Socrates is dialoguing with Mino, and at one point Socrates talks to Mino's servant, and in that conversation, one of the major theories of Socratic philosophy emerges, the theory of recollection. So boom, we have this new concept. Maybe someone is looking at that and saying, well, dialogue, conversation, communication, all that just is philosophy because Socrates had this dialogue, he had this communication between Mino and between him and Mino's servant and he came up with one of his most important ideas, one of his most important concepts. What are Deleuze and Guattari tr really trying to avoid here though? They're not denying that communication plays an integral role in philosophy. Obviously it's very hard to do philosophy if you can't talk about your ideas with people. They're not saying that communication is not an important part of philosophy, but they're trying to get us to get clear on the distinction between the two. It's a part of philosophy, but it is not itself philosophy, on their view. Deleuze and Guattari then go on to make a pretty striking claim, which is basically that they're saying, hey, don't take our word for it when we say that philosophy is not communication. The ancient Greek philosophers, they would have agreed with us. They seem to be arguing that the ancient Greek philosophers themselves held communication at a distance, or that they even held it in contempt. But why did they say so? Let's stay with the Greek philosophers. Something that underpinned Socrates' philosophical project was the assumption that popular opinion is not always the same thing as truth that it is therefore a mistake to think that just because everyone else agrees with something that it's the correct view to hold. One of the reasons for this is that very often the beliefs that we hold, especially those which we haven't thought critically about the way that Socrates would have us do, are very often not correct. This is something that Socrates points out many times in the Socratic Dialogues. For example, he points this out in the Euthyphro when he points out the contradictions in the beliefs Euthyphro holds about what piety consists of. This is something that he admonishes his friends against doing. He admonishes his friends against falling for what he calls what the many believe. The many are basically all of us who don't think the way Socrates thinks we should, those of us who don't think philosophically, those of us who don't love wisdom, we just kind of go along with what everybody else is doing. 
we're the many. Um, he admonishes his friends not to believe what the many believe, like in the Credo, when he admonishes his friends Credo uh, not to believe, as the many do, that the welfare of the body should be privileged over that of the soul. Credo is very upset that Socrates is about to be executed, and Socrates is telling him, don't worry about it, I have a soul, it's, it's not that big of a deal. So another distinction between there's the philosophers, the lovers of wisdom, and the many. There's another distinction uh, made more explicitly by Plato between knowledge, that is that which we arrive at through some kind of critical inquiry, and what Plato calls doxa, which is basically an opinion. It's an opinion that might be popular, something that people hold precisely because everyone else seems to think that's the way it is. Something that people agree on, generally. So maybe another word for that might be consensus. Furthermore, Socrates and his dialogues, he's not aiming at consensus. He's, he's using a very specific kind of philosophical inquiry. It even has its own name, the Socratic method, in which he is not looking for agreement. He's not looking for everyone to agree with each other, necessarily. He's actually trying to point out how much disagreement there already is in the beliefs that people hold, especially when he's trying to point out the contradictions in someone's understanding of a given concept. So Deleuze and Guattari may have thought that while some may think that the Greek philosophers really cherished communication and considered philosophy to just be communication, perhaps because of this importance of dialogue going on between a, a, a philosopher like Socrates and an interlocutor, and that the belief in the triumph of reason and the triumph of the better opinion, that all we have to do is just have a better reason to believe something, and that's all it takes to solve all the problems that we have in society. Deleuze and Guattari may have thought that, well, actually, the Greek philosophers seem to have their entire philosophical project underpinned by an assumption that is quite contrary to that idea. It seems like what underpins, at least one of the underpinning assumptions of, of Socrates' project, is actually that no matter how many people share an opinion, no matter how many people agree on something, it doesn't make it true necessarily. In fact, if this were not one of the basic starting points of philosophy, it would not make sense for a philosopher like Socrates to try and get people to inquire more deeply into the beliefs they hold and into why they hold them. In fact, by the end of a Socratic dialogue, if you or I were dialoguing with Socrates, our brains would be fried because the goal of a Socratic dialogue, when Socrates is, is talking with an interlocutor, is not to produce uh, agreement. It's to show you all the holes and flaws in your way of thinking. So by the end of a Socratic dialogue, if you're the interlocutor with Socrates, you are aware of all the things you don't know. And in that space that has been carved out by that kind of philosophical inquiry, by that kind of negative philosophy, as it's sometimes called, in that space that's been carved out, that's where creativity can, can blossom, can thrive. So maybe what Deleuze and Guattari are really trying to, to get us to understand here is that from the very beginning, philosophy has always been about not pointing out where, not, not getting us to agree, but actually getting us to see where disagreements are because that's where creativity can thrive. That's where a new concept can emerge. So how about this ironical soliloquy bird and these drunken guests at the banquet? What's up with that? What are Deleuze and Guattari talking about here? It's very, very hard to say for sure. And I do have a couple of theories, but I want to leave it up to you to think about what these possible reference points actually have to do with the argument that Deleuze and Guattari are making, that philosophy is not communication. Given that we've been talking about the Greek philosophers, I've been thinking that at least one of these references must refer to something in ancient Greek philosophy, and that is the drunken guests at the banquet. I would encourage you to look at a scene towards the end of the symposium, which is a work by Plato, 
there's a scene where Socrates has just delivered a great speech and everyone is clapping and telling him he did a great job. And then this guy Alcibiades comes stumbling in drunk, dressed in an elaborate costume, and he wants everybody else to get drunk. And then he plops himself down on the couch and he starts talking. I would encourage you to look into that scene because that's the one that comes to mind for me. That's what I'm thinking about. As far as what the actual connection is, that's something that I would encourage others to think about. Because, to be honest, I'm really, really not sure. Um, maybe Deleuze and Guattari are trying to say that it doesn't matter if you have persuasive arguments because at the end of the day, some guy in a crazy costume is going to come and ruin your, your speech by being drunk and boisterous. I, I'm really not sure. Um, maybe something to think about. It's also entirely possible and certainly not unlikely that I could have the wrong reference point. That's also very possible. So I would really like to see, because I have never been able to come across any satisfying explanation of this particular sentence. Um, the same thing with the ironical soliloquy bird. The only thing that I can come up with, and this, my theory here, it has absolutely nothing to do with philosophy. Uh, the only thing that I could ever come up with was, was a scene in the Shakespeare play Macbeth. Uh, a scene in, in act, the first act of Macbeth. This is a scene where Duncan, who at the time is the king of Scotland, has arrived at the castle where Macbeth lives. And Lady Macbeth, who of course is in on the whole plot to kill Duncan, spoiler alert, that Dun Duncan dies. Duncan has no idea that he's going to be murdered at this castle. And Lady Macbeth is talking to him and making him feel very comfortable and very welcome. Banquo, who is with Duncan, uh, remarks on how peaceful the setting is. He remarks on how beautiful the castle is. He remarks on a, a marlet, which is a kind of bird, and remarks on how peaceful and, and, and comfortable the, the bird looks in its little nest. And of course, the audience, when they're watching this, everybody knows what's going to happen. And Duncan, who is going to be murdered, he doesn't know anything, so he just feels very comfortable and welcome. So it's an example of, of irony, obviously. And um, maybe Deleuze and Guattari think that just like Duncan, who doesn't know what he's getting into when he goes to the castle of the Macbeths, uh, maybe people who are looking for ancient Greek philosophy to justify their view that philosophy is communication, don't know what they're going getting themselves into. Again, really not sure. I would encourage others to think about this line and let you know, let everyone else know in the comments what, what kind of thoughts you have on this. Ultimately, though, let's not get distracted. Whatever this reference is, it is not, it is not support for their argument. That it is, it is an example or it's, it's something to, uh, or it's a poetic way of expressing something that they already think that they have uh, argued for successfully, whether they have or not is certainly up for debate. It's very important to understand the distinction between an example, a, an explanation, and an expression. All those things are great in a philosophical text, but none of them are the same thing as, as evidence. What can we say? Is philosophy communication? Well, we've seen that philosophy knows the art of forming concepts, according to Deleuze and Guattari. Forming concepts, as they've articulated more clearly here, is necessarily something disruptive. That's just how they understand creativity. It's the disruption of the status quo. Uh, the, uh, the, the arising of a new concept, for Deleuze especially, is always predicated on some older concept no longer doing its job. It's no longer completely accounting for something as, as well as some new proposed concept is supposed to do. So a new concept only emerges out of a need for such a concept. And necessarily, that concept which arises out of a need is going to be arising at a moment in which frustration. Consensus, uh, communication on the other hand, aims towards consensus. Consensus is agreement. Does disrupting the status quo line up very well with people 
being in agreement. I, I should say not. So if we accept Deleuze and Guattari's definitions, philosophy, art of forming concepts, communication, that which aims at consensus, and if we accept their understanding of philosophy's creative nature being necessarily disruptive, it seems logical to conclude that philosophy is in fact not communication. 